Welcome back. I'm Peter St. Ange. This is a weekly roundup of my daily videos on the economy and freedom, where I cut through the BS and lay out what the gaslighting clowns pulled out of their hats this week and what is coming next. The federal government is graduating from scapegoating inflation to actually breaking stuff. Last week, a visibly angry Joe Biden read his State of the Union speech out loud, no mean feat for Joe. In it, he raged that the inflation he caused by printing $6 trillion to buy lockdowns and unicorn farts made potato chip bags smaller. He told us even the Cookie Monster noticed, which was probably a joke, but it is hard to know because Joe Biden hallucinates. Now, I recently mentioned groceries are among the lowest margin products on earth. They make about two pennies on the dollar, meaning groceries half to pass along inflation. If you print $6 trillion, it will make the cookies expensive. Companies can handle this by raising the price, or if they think customers can't pay a higher price, they'll shrink the product to where they think the customer can afford it. Now, it's worth noting companies don't want to shrink product. They normally compete to make products bigger and better, since customers like that are more likely to buy. So they only shrink when their costs are going up and they think the customer cannot handle it. Charles Payne had a great segment also last week showing how much of inflation has been hidden by product shrinkage. Across the board, since 2019, shrinkage has soaked up between a fifth and a quarter of inflation, meaning prices would be a lot higher if they had not shaved. To illustrate, the price of cocoa, a main ingredient of chocolate, almost doubled since pre-pandemic. Yet chocolate bars did not double in price, they didn't even go up 50%, they got smaller. Of course, there's another related phenomenon I like to call crapflation, which is when a product doesn't get smaller, it gets worse. Business Insider recently put out a survey of companies doing this, so margarine replacing oils with water, or yes, cookies replacing sugar with high fructose corn syrup, or speaking of chocolate, replacing cocoa butter with sunflower oils, which makes the chocolate waxy and tasteless. Aunt Jemima, for example, no longer contains any maple syrup at all. It's high fructose corn syrup, preservatives, and food coloring. Put them together, and if food is getting smaller and it's getting crappier, it means official food inflation is massively underreported. By how much? Well, in a recent video, I talked about testing official inflation numbers against the humble Big Mac, which is a standard in foreign exchange analyses, since Big Macs are made of a bunch of things so food, labor, trucks, rent, electricity. So they are thought to capture economy-wide inflation. Now, doing that suggests that official U.S. numbers undercount inflation by almost half, and they've been doing that for decades. So what's next? Government standard practice is break things, then blame whoever is handy. If they're slick, they'll even cash the scapegoat into some fresh new government power. So they will keep going after greedy companies. Dems already have task forces in Congress to prosecute wrong pricing and wrong sizing. Sure, one might ask why companies got greedy under Biden, but they weren't under Trump, but then we have journalists who memory hold that one. And what is the end game? We've been here before when Richard Nixon also had runaway inflation to scapegoat, and he did also blame it on grocery stores. The result was shrinkage and crapflation, but the next step was much more ominous, price controls. Those led to widespread shortages, gasoline lines that stretched for miles, yet had little impact on inflation. So if they keep it up, we could see that again, meaning for now, keep your gas tank and your pantry full. Hardship withdrawals from 401k retirement accounts just hit a fresh record in yet another Biden miracle. In fact, they're currently running two to three times the pre-pandemic rate. As Smart Asset put it, Americans are increasingly relying on their retirement accounts to pay the bills. Yesterday, the Wall Street Journal reported on a study finding that emergency withdrawals from 401ks, which are one of the main retirement vehicles used by Americans, just hit back-to-back -back records in 2022 and 2023. At this point, almost one in seven Americans with a 401k have a loan outstanding. Nearly 40% of those who took a hardship distribution did it to avoid foreclosure. The second most common reason was unpaid medical bills, which terrorized middle-class Americans. New hardship withdrawals, according to Vanguard, are up 30% on the year. Fidelity found they're even higher, fully 6.9% of planned participants taking out a new hardship loan. As background here, federal law allows 401k holders to borrow up to half their retirement accounts for a, quote, immediate and heavy financial need. 
such as medical bills, car repairs, an unexpected moving expense as in you were fired, or a family member funeral. Of course, borrowing effectively withdraws the money with a promise to make it up. In theory, you can pay it back and avoid the penalties and taxes, but in reality, many do not pay it back, causing a permanent dip in their retirement income that, going by American savings rate, was probably dramatically underfunded to begin with. So what's driving the withdrawals? Easy. People cannot afford routine bills. They're squeezed between rising prices and falling real wages. So trillions in stimulus checks had hidden the pain, but now those are gone. People have run out of extra savings. In fact, they're going into debt at a record pace. So recent data found household debt hitting a record $17.5 trillion. That's almost $150,000 per household. With credit cards charging 24%, which is slightly less than the mafia, people are instead turning to rating the retirement account. Now, keep in mind, 401ks are for people who have jobs. That's how you can get one. We can only imagine what's happening to people who don't have full-time income. But we don't have to imagine. A recent study by Wharton found that households earning less than 20000 have suffered the worst of inflation. The rich could make up for it with rising asset prices, since inflation makes stuff go up. The poor, lacking such assets, got the full brunt. As a result, one recent study found that the majority of Americans, so 57%, cannot cover an unexpected $1,000 cost, something that at today's prices you can easily hit with a broken down car or a sick pet. For them, they can't even raid the 401k. It's off to the credit card mines they go. Well, either that or hope the dog gets better. So what's next? Media will continue lecturing Americans that the solution to our current stagflation is spend less. A few weeks ago, the Wall Street Journal provided helpful diet advice suggesting, quote, to save money, maybe you should skip breakfast. Of course, the other idea would be end inflation by limiting federal spending and grow the economy to secure jobs that actually do pay more every year instead of less. Grow the pie instead of lecturing Americans to make do with less. Unfortunately, the Washington Uniparty has little interest in either spending restraint or in reducing government interference in what should be one of the world's fastest growing economies. I'm a big fan of saving Bitcoin for the long term, and the Unchained Bitcoin IRA is a great way to do that. You get the tax advantages, and if it's a Roth IRA, you're not going to pay capital gains so long as you hodl. Most Bitcoin IRAs make you give up control, which can expose you to exchange hacks or even relend it out like banks do. With Unchained, you control the keys to your Bitcoin, which means you always know it's there. They also provide one-on-one concierge service to walk you through it and answer any questions. Why pay more taxes than you need to? Set it up today at Unchained.com. Use promo code PETER to get $100 off a Bitcoin IRA. Just when you thought it was safe to go back to the grocery store, inflation is back for another pound of flesh. New inflation numbers came out yesterday, and they were ugly. On an annualized basis, the CPI was up 5.4% in February. That's up from 3.7% annualized in January, 2.8% in December, 1.9% in November, and just 0.9% annualized in October. Spot the pattern. That puts annualized inflation just below where it was in March of 2021 when it really started taking off, ultimately hitting an annualized 16% by mid-22. Ominously, the New York Fed separately reported that consumer inflation expectations also jumped last month, something they hadn't done in two years, but something they did do at the outset of the 21 inflation. The latest numbers put the body count at 19% inflation, that's official inflation, since Bidenomics was unleashed upon the American people. Of course, the media is downplaying all this, running with the year-on-year numbers, which don't look nearly so bad at 3.2. Yes, that's almost double the Fed's sacred target, but it is not 5.4. In fact, the Wall Street Journal this very moment titles their inflation article as, quote, slightly hotter than expected. Of course, the only reason it's so low as 3.2 is because the year-ago numbers were driven by oil coming down as the world routed around the Ukraine war, and above all by the China crash, which tanked demand for oil, China is the world's biggest importer, and also crashed consumer goods prices as Chinese dumped unsold manufacturing output. It's worth noting media also did this when inflation took off in 2021, emphasizing year-on-year numbers to take the sting out of the bad data, just long enough to cover the transitory inflation gaslight that we all remember. It's almost like they say what they're told to. So what's driving the resurgence in inflation? In short, food and housing. Food was up an annualized 6% on the month, 
Of course, it's worse if you include shrinking products and crappier ingredients, crapflation. Shelter, meaning housing and rent, is up 6% on the year. Car insurance is up over 20%. Airfares took off up by a third in the past two months on an annualized basis, for which you get a plane that the wheels fall off. The one bright spot was goods deflation as Chinese overproduction continues flooding in. I mentioned this the other day, a short-term help fall in inflation, but of course at the cost of our remaining domestic manufacturers. So what's next? I've worried in recent videos that we're repeating the 1970s catastrophe when government spending drove inflation and then the Fed tried to fix it by strangling the real economy with high rates. What happened in the 70s, aside from Captain Tennille, is the spending never came down. Meaning after a temporary pause in inflation, transitory pause you might say, it came roaring back bigger than ever. That inflation ran more than five years and only ended with rate hikes so savage, nearly 20%, that they crashed us into a pair of severe recessions with 10% unemployment that, of course, cost Jimmy Carter his job. The problem is if we do get a repeat of the 70s, I don't think Washington will be willing to fix it this time, specifically because it cost Jimmy Carter his job. So they're dumb, but they're not that dumb. So rather than take one for the good of the country, modern Washington may well let inflation run, massaging the statistics and gaslighting with media to ignore the pain as long as possible, which would mean years of stagflation culminating in a horrific purge that could make the 70s look like a garden party. Joe Biden just proposed his budget for next year, and it's a doozy. At $7.3 trillion, it accelerates the transfer of America's wealth from the people who earned it and who use it to make stuff and feed their families to the government, where it's used to pay off donors and bankers, import illegal voters, and, of course, to start new wars. In numbers, Biden's proposing to spend $7.3 trillion next year. That would be almost 20% above this year's out-of-control spending. It would also represent roughly one-third of the annual output of the 330 souls in our country. It's worth noting our economy did not actually grow 20% last year, so they will be taking a bigger piece of the pie, a much bigger piece, on a decade basis, which is how Washington counts. It represents $12 trillion in new spending. By the way, there are some glaring blank spaces in the Biden budget, such as Social Security and Child Credits, which mean the actual proposal is much higher. Still, even without those, the new budget would add another $16 trillion to the national debt, taking it past $50 trillion in just 10 years. For perspective, 10 years ago, America was ironically recovering from the red wedding scene in Game of Thrones. So here comes another one. Why so much money? Well, Joe's got cronies to feed, wars to start, and a green revolution to return us to the Stone Age. Moreover, presumably they figure Americans can afford it. But with $17.5 trillion in household debt, it's about $150,000 per family, along with record hardship withdrawals on retirement accounts and record credit card balances running at 24% interest. So how will they pay for it all? Easy, they will not. Well, to be fair, they'll cover part of it with $5 trillion in new taxes, which comes to $36,000 per family, because that pie ain't gonna eat itself. As always, the new taxes are billed as hitting corporations, which all economists know get passed on to regular customers, along with the ever-popular taxes on the wealthy that somehow manage to hit everybody. The corporate tax cut would walk back Trump's tax relief, hiking the corporate rate back to 28%, combined with state tax that would bring the corporate rate to almost 33%. That would be one of the highest in the world. It's almost twice the rate in Canada, Germany, or Japan, and a full third above China's corporate tax. This would naturally kill jobs and send companies overseas. So one study estimated it would cost 1 million jobs in the first two years, then a continual annual decline of 600,000 jobs per year for a decade. So that's 7 million jobs, so the feds can get their little paws on another pot of honey. Meanwhile, Biden would hike taxes on anybody making 400,000, which means pretty much every entrepreneur who's built something of value, while the truly rich, of course, hire better accountants or move their money offshore. So as always, the taxes hit the hardworking, but they skip the very plutocrats who were used as the poster child to sell the tax. So what's next? President's budgets never get passed as is. They're more messaging documents painting a picture of what Biden would like to do if Republicans let him. Unfortunately, the GOP has proved itself spineless quizlings of the Washington Uniparty, beholden to the special interests who fund their campaigns, and the golden parachutes that come with playing along. 
So I wouldn't be surprised if we see Biden-level spending hikes. They could even be worse once Congress throws in their pork. As for the taxes, they may not come today. Special interests do, after all, block taxes. But with trillion-dollar deficits, more taxes are coming. This podcast is supported by our sponsor, MoneyMetals.com, the most trusted bullion dealer and depository in the United States. Known for their competitive pricing, excellent customer service, and fast delivery of physical gold and silver, as well as their educational content and advocacy for sound money policies at the state and federal level. They have set the industry standard for selling, buying, and storing precious metals. If you're looking to help protect yourself against inflation and market turmoil, I hope you'll give them a try. To learn more or to buy your physical gold and silver, go to moneymetals.com. If you dream of escaping the cubicle and starting a farm, new data says America's farmers are getting wiped out, leaving hollowed-out communities that rival the Rust Belt. A few days ago, the USDA reported that the number of farms in America plunged by 140,000 in the past five years. That's roughly 2,500 farms going bust every month. They're mostly small farms, so farms earning below 50,000 dropped by almost 10%, while large farms, those earning over a million, actually grew by 36%. So what's driving the great extinction? Simple, rising costs, falling revenue, and green mandates. Together, according to the USDA, these are expected to crash farm income this year by another 25%. Bringing income for the roughly 2 million farms in America to just over $110 billion, that's $55,000 per farm, Not per farmer, per farm. For perspective, that's about one-fifth of revenue at Amazon.com for all the farms in America. Of course, the falling revenue is partly from productivity, better seas, better machines, and those do reduce costs to consumers. But combined with relentless costs, up $17 last year alone, and rampant green mandates, they are driving farmers into the dirt. To give a flavor, the FDA admits that a single proposed rule on sustainability, the so-called produce rule, will cost a typical small farm 13000 per year. That's one-fifth what they're making now for a single rule. And these rules are nonstop. There are thousands of them covering everything from renewable mandates to cow farts. In fact, Europe's farmers are currently blockading their cities for that very reason. The decline of American farming has been going on for decades, and it's accelerating. Since 1950, a number of farms in America have dropped by nearly 4 million. So that's about two-thirds while the number of acres under cultivation dropped by a quarter, an area roughly the size of the state of Texas. This has driven an exodus of population from farming areas, mirroring the Rust Belt collapse, also driven by government harassment of domestic producers. Together, they've depopulated great swaths of America, leaving abandoned main streets and empty town squares that used to be full of people on Sunday. Of course, these regulations and taxes don't only hit farms and manufacturers, they hit everybody from family restaurants to corner stores, leaving many of these depopulated towns essentially a crossroads with nothing but a gas station, a McDonald's, and a Walmart. Chain stores big enough to digest regulations that would bankrupt a family business. In fact, they often lobby for those regulations for that very reason. To give a sense, a recent study by the National Association of Manufacturers estimated that federal regulations alone costs large manufacturers, those with more than 100 workers, an average of 25000 per employee, which is roughly half their salary. But those cost small companies, those with fewer than 50 workers, more than double that at 50000 per employee. So the family business simply cannot compete with the chains because of the regulations alone. So what's next? The solution is as easy in farming as it is in manufacturing. Get rid of the mandates, the regulations, and the taxes on especially small business. Government has become a predator on the small businesses of America, and so long as that continues, they will keep hollowing out entire regions of the country from the Rust Belt to the Corn Belt. Thanks for listening. Remember to subscribe to get next week's episode fresh in your inbox and go to petersanonge.com to read the weekly articles with charts and all the gory details. Okay, we'll be watching. See you next time.